call this public meeting of the Eagle Mountain Saginaw Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present and that this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. Welcome everybody to the December meeting and Merry Christmas to everybody. I know we have a big party uh, ahead of us to uh, enjoy the Christmas season, but we're all looking forward to that. Cleet, we're also looking forward to you starting our meeting off with the uh, first report. <coughs> Okay, we'll start off with uh, Copper Creek um, Elementary, and as you can see, that's the, uh, the front entrance is starting to come together with the uh, front doors right in front of the census truck. And then, of course, you see some rock there, some steel around that. Kind of working back over toward the, I guess I always come back to the dumpster area, but uh, what I want to show you is that if you see that grate right in front of the dumpster area, so if you've ever seen a dumpster that they throw, it gets water in it, and therefore it's going to rust, well, as you can see, that trench drain, that'll catch that, and so you don't have those long streaks of, on your concrete all the way going down for hundreds of feet and all those stains, so that kind of helps that. And On the bottom, when you see where the canopy would be located, you see the, those are the piers that have been installed. I've uh, been talking about this cafeteria area, but you, what I really want to show you there, that's the finished look with the brick, the rock, you got the glazing in there. So that part is really coming together. Now the bottom part, that's a problem. That's the gymnasium, that's the storm shelter. Remember it's being built off site. So it'll be brought in, uh, it's projected to come in in uh, January, end of January. So that's where that will go. And then uh, around the kitchen area, and you can see that they're putting in some of the, uh, those are the freezers down the bottom. So they're starting to pull off that protective covering. You see the tiling, and then you see the little, the, the office for the uh, manager and she, he or she can look out the window into the kitchen area. Uh, the main part of the, the uh, where you have the stage and you have the main uh, where the kids will be sitting and that's starting to come together. You see the lighting in the ceiling, you see the ceiling grid, you see the fur downs and you see paint. That's a finished paint up in there. So from looking at the front of the building to where you, the kitchen, there's two dramatically different phases of where they're at in construction. This is the hallway between the gym and the cafeteria. Light fixtures again, ceiling grids. Uh, this is in the, by the media center of the library. Uh, you see the fur downs at the top. And then this is one of the computer rooms. What I really wanted to show you there is you look at all that HVAC. That's stuff that you normally never will see. You might see the grills, but mm -hmm. every room and every part of this building, there's just a maze of networks of HVAC above the ceiling. So I just wanted to show you all that goes on and how much of that goes on. Uh, down the academic wings, uh, at the top left, you see the blocking uh, for the TVs uh, or the monitor screen, and you see the, the gentleman on the bottom right, he's putting the electrical in into the, uh, into the walls. And then uh, you have the HVAC, the little hanging straps coming down so they can start uh, installing that on the bottom left. Uh, again, you just have rock there going in construction. And I snuck a guy, these, these are our, our two folks that are out there, they've just been getting some water for some of the workers. So I got, I kind of, I didn't stage that, I just kind of said something, they turned around, we snapped a picture. So I kind of caught them off guard. Any questions about anything about Copper Creek? Okay. We'll kind of just go some of the progress updates and um, some of these have not changed. Uh, we're still working on punch lifts, punch list on uh, Creekview, Highland and Gillen. Uh, the Boswell Athletic Plan will be coming with phase one of the interim budget. Uh, it's really focusing on the Ag Center. You'll see uh, see that tonight. And uh, Beaver Thompson will be here. They received the bids. And then we'll present those for your consideration later. Uh, the uh, security projects, you have the cameras and you have the hardware component of that and the access. So we're going through that <coughs> diligently uh, to make sure we can have as much accurate information we can when we go out um, to get pricing on that. Uh, the update on the turf fields. So the biggest thing right now hindering that is the weather. Being able to get the uh, drilling rigs to go out there and core down and find out what's underneath our fields. So it has to be dry. And right now it's pretty moist. We're doing everything we can to hopefully at least get the first four projects started, which would be um, the middle schools minus Wayside. So I guess it's Creekview, Prairie Vista, Highland, and uh, Ed Wilkie 
get those in the February 1 type uh, window and we still have to get them surveyed. So we're trying to pull all that together, get that to our civil engineer and get that to y'all. So hopefully we can get that uh, by January and start February 1. If not, it'll push it back a month. But each one of those will take about 90 days, phase one of that, which of those four. Once we finish those, we'll come back with Wayside and the two high schools. And either way, one of them will be finished either uh, August 1st, if we're delayed, it may you know be the middle of August or, or so forth. Just depends on the weather. But we're working hard on that. We've got some tennis record, uh, court resurfacing still working on that with the wind slats. Uh, we got the carpet still working on that. And Lake Country uh, still projected uh, 2020 uh, beginning on that in the spring. Late spring, maybe early summer on that. And then the central office, that's where I just came from. We're still working with our architect on that, working on design and uh, Hopefully get to a point where the end of January, we say start on the actual, getting the documents prepared. And then to come around October, uh, hopefully we can get started in construction on that project. And then on Eagle Mountain High School, uh, we recommend an architect for y'all's consideration tonight. So any questions on any of those? I know I went fast, but it's fast and furious construction wise right now. Thank you. All right, next is capital improvements projects update. Mr. Hamilton. <coughs> Welcome, Charles. Good afternoon. All right, so we have uh, a few projects that we're going to look at completing uh, this summer. Uh, seven of them are going to be elementary school projects, and those are going to entail, one of them is High Country Elementary, which we will be redoing uh, one of the playground units there that has some severe delamination of, of the uh, coating on some of the, the pieces on there. So we're working with the contractor on that to get that uh, replaced. Uh, Greenfield Elementary and uh, High Country are both going to have a resurface of their gym floors. Uh, the, the product there has, has got some uh, defects in it that are starting to become a problem, so we're going to get a, a new surface put on those. Saginaw Elementary School uh, is the only elementary that we have that has a true wood floor. Uh, it's getting to the point where it's really getting dark and dingy, so we're going to have that re-sanded, repainted, and refinished this summer. So that'll have a, a new uh, surface on it. Uh, Willow Creek, Lake Point, and uh, Parkview, we're going to be doing some curb replacement out front of the campuses. The way the curbs were originally designed, uh, there was apparently a little bit of a flaw in there, and some of the rebar in there is starting to pop out and cause that curb to come apart and cause a lot of concrete pieces. Lame. So we'll come in there and recut re all that out and put new curb in uh, so that that front driveway will be clean and, and uh, safe for everybody to to drive through there. We'll have three high school projects. Saginaw High School, we're gonna have a cooling tower on the plant. Uh, the, there's a material in there called fill that is uh, over time gets to deteriorate and it starts to clog up the system. So we gotta come in and have that cooling tower redone with that material on inside of that tower where the fans are on the top and you see the steam coming out. Uh, so that project will be uh, try to get accomplished this summer. Uh, Chisholm Trail High School and Boswell High School uh, have some window issues that we're going to try to correct. These are uh, at Boswell in the Anderson buildings. These windows, for some reason, are collecting and maintaining some moisture down in the tracks below the windows. It causes them to fog up there along the bottom. Uh, so uh, we've had a contractor look at that, try to get those pulled out and replaced with a, a, and there'll be double pane, it'll be a lot more e energy efficient for the building. So it'll be a really good project to get those windows replaced. Chisholm Trail High School has a similar issue on some of the big windows that are along the uh, cheerleading gym. The cheerleading gym has on certain rain events, it's not every one, but certain rain events, uh, rain is getting in these, it has those awnings with the little curved pieces on it, it's kind of hard to describe, but. Uh, there's some seal or something in there that's broken, so we're going to have that looked at uh, and try to get those windows sealed up so they won't uh, 
to get water down in there during a major rain event. Halfley Development Center uh, the, has a, uh, uh, the HVAC plan in the back has a control system that is starting to become obsolete. It's very difficult to get parts for, so we're gonna have that control system replaced. Uh, but we'll need a time frame when, the, when it's a low volume the kids aren't in there, so we'll try to do that this summer as well. Uh, and then we have some various campuses where we're gonna go through and do some painting uh, inside the schools, but we're gonna focus on the wear and tear areas, the door jams, uh, more specifically on the inside of all the classrooms where they get hands and they get chipped and tore up, so we're going to try to paint those. And then the out, outside doors, a lot of the uh, mechanical rooms, electrical rooms, they have those solid metal doors, and over time they start to fade and they look bad, and you'll see a number on them. Uh, we're going to get those painted as well. So uh, we've got a, a, a list of a few campuses that we want to try to get started with that. So that's the list that we're going to try to work on this summer and uh, get accomplished before August. Charles, would you say most of that is is um, just maintenance that we would expect the cooler at Saginaw, its its useful life has come that? Because some of those things sound like maybe the product wasn't installed. The, the, the fill material in that cooling tower is typically designed to go about 12 to 15 years. Okay. There's a lot of factors involved in that. One of them is the chemical balance of the water that winds up trickling down through there. In the past, we've had some struggles with our contractor to make sure that chemical balance stays proper, and if it doesn't, it gets off, and then it starts <coughs> to deteriorate that material a little quicker than we uh, anticipated. But we've still gotten, you know, we're still up on that 12, 13 year range. So it, it's time for that to get done. Is there just one on that campus, or is there? There's two towers, and we will start with one, because we don't want to take two down ever. Right. So we'll do take one down uh, right now. Anticipate the other one would probably fall shortly thereafter. It, it's not showing that much damage, but the the one and when I say damage, it, it starts to flake off. It comes down back through the system, and when it goes back into the chiller, it clogs up the screens because that little, those little pieces of the material are coming off of there. And the other things like the curb, that sounds like the rebar. Was it set properly? It, on some of them, it looks like it got very close to the surface. Normally, rebar, you need about a three-inch cover on concrete. And if you get less than that, and there's any movement in the ground, then sometimes that'll pop the concrete. And we do, we do have some of those curves. If you drive <coughs> through there, you'll see a little chunk of concrete about every 18 inches that's popped off. And that's because that rebar probably got set a little too close to the surface. And that's only at Parkview. Well, you said there no, was no. A there's three road. campuses: uh, Willow Creek, Parkview, and, and uh, Lake Point are the ones that we're going to start on that particular project. And the windows is that a um, product defect or an installation? Or well, we would like to have another contractor look at it. The first one we had look at it is. He says that it looks like there was some defect with the install. Uh, I'd like to get another company to look at it, but we'll go ahead and proceed to try to make sure we get the specs and everything done in time so that it won't be a problem. But it looks like the frames may have been flipped on them and that there's a channel in there that didn't get set right. And so what has a tendency to happen is when it rains and water gets down in there, instead of draining out properly, it retains itself and you get a little bit of that moisture, then it starts to fog up the bottom of the window. <coughs> With us building more stuff, I would hope that those contractors, I mean, we learned something from this that, I don't know if there's the people that installed it or the product itself, but it seems like Typically, um, yeah, construction is usually a one-year warranty. Right. If, unless you can prove that it's what we call a latent defect. Very difficult to prove sometimes. Right. Yeah, I, I would understand that. Especially for the time, the amount of time those have been installed. Well, I, <clears throat> I'd like to think, I know some of this may be defects, may be poor work, workmanship, but whatever the, whatever the case is, I'd just like to, I appreciate y'all being proactive yeah. <clears throat> and catching stuff whenever it is and getting it fixed and doing it periodically like this and get it on, on schedules because we've all been to other school districts that look that some of their schools are a lot newer than ours and they look like they're 40 years old. So, <clears throat> you know, we, I know every, I can speak for everybody up here. We appreciate y'all's due diligence and 
keeping our schools uh, looking like you know we want them to look. Thank you, appreciate yep. it. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, that brings us to uh, education service report. Dr. Parker. And it's already up there, yay. Well, and Dr. Heather Hughes is presenting with me and we, we uh, got with each other, really. We really did, we saw each other this morning and we're like, oh wow. Uh, as you're aware, we have had a continued growth in severe behavior needs for our children who fall on, under the umbrella of special education services. And we want to present to you tonight a program that we feel like will address many of these needs. So we'll be sharing together. Um, we have increased number of students receiving special ed services. We've had an increased number of students with intense behavior needs, and which is resulting in injury to staff and other students. Because of this, it also creates disruptions on the campus, classroom, and student learning. We have, um, we began a partnership with Mary Key about the, for 18 months now. We have four students presently uh, at Mary Key uh, under their care. But with what uh, we're looking at moving forward with, we'll be bringing those back to the campus. So, yes. so prior to considering um, the need to add intensive programming here in the district, we first uh, looked at, we relocated some light programs um, on current campuses, particularly at the elementary level. So we spread out um, programming where we had two of light programs. So we tried to address the student needs that way by having a fewer number of children with intense needs on a campus. And then we increased the one-on-one -on -one support. So when we identified these students with intensive needs, we actually had them uh, with one-on-one -on -one pair of support in an attempt to try to help, again, manage uh, their behavior and create a safer uh, learning environment. We've also added, as you all are aware, we've added classrooms to try to keep the staff uh, to student ratios um, manageable for um, students who are in special classes. And then we've also provided um, specialized training and support to try to build the capacity of the teachers in the district to serve uh, the intense needs of, of, of our student, a growing student population. With this though, we continue to see disruptive um, disruption of the learning environment on the home campus. We also have an increased uh, sustained injuries to our staff in the current uh, instructional setting. So, our efforts to address the problem without creating a new program have not resulted in an increase uh, in safety for staff and students or a reduction in the intensity of the student behavior. So we've come up with teams. So we did a survey of, of districts in surrounding areas to see how they were addressing the needs of students with intense behavior needs and they actually have intensive programming as part of their special education continuum. And so that's what we are looking to do is expand our continuum of services. So it would allow us to provide, um, it's a more restrictive environment and that it's more restrictive in the types of supports it'll be, um, but it's, it still keeps them within the district so that we're not having to look um, out of district at non-public placements in order to meet um, student needs. So it would ultimately increase our capacity and then reduce cost also. So the, what makes this program different than some of our other programs is it's, it's highly, highly structured. So it's even more structured than the specialized. It would be a specialized, specialized wing uh, where we have the students would not have access or participate in the other non-academic or extracurricular activities because their needs are primarily um, focused on behavioral redirection and teaching them appropriate responding or reducing the intensity of their current responding. It would provide um, a higher, so we'd have a higher staff, a lower student ratio so that we could more effectively manage uh, the intense needs of the students. It would also um, be a smaller physical environment. So again, the students would not have access. They've shown us through their behavioral needs that they can't handle uh, being on a regular campus. So this would reduce um, the camp their, their school environments to increase the likelihood of them experiencing uh, more success. And then it also allows us to, they, um, to intensely uh, focus on intensive behavior intervention and we would be using very specialized uh, behavior, uh, intensive behavior management strategies to try to, to teach, um, teach appropriate responding and hopefully reduce the, the dangerous uh, behavior. The program requirements mean that when the location 
in the, on a district campus with a controlled access that does separate them from the regular campus activities. You see the specialized three times in this, specialized staffing, specialized environmental uh, accommodations, as well as instructional resources. So we have that, and we have found a spot at Saginaw Elementary, part of their old building. We've, we've been there, we've viewed that, and we can uh, renovate that spot very easily with minimal cost so that we have a very contained area. The program access, to gain access into this program, we're really looking at anywhere, uh, currently we believe we'll have about 10 children once we get make the transitions from where they currently are into the setting and then uh, other things <coughs> that they would need. So we would have, it would be for students who already have been identified through the ARD process and have individualized education programs who are not progressing. On, um, on their IEPs due to the significance of their uh, the, the behavior, and that this behavior is a persistent disruption. So it's for children that, even with all the other interventions that we provided on their, their currently current assigned campus, that they've not responded, and that we're continuing to experience uh, injury to themselves, to staff, and also to other students. Um, so they're, um, and so that danger would be documented. We have behavior support staff who would have had a history of working with the campus and the students to try to reduce the behavior and then ultimately it would be an art committee decision based upon a review of each student's individualized needs and, and their data. Uh, right now, um, our, our students with the most intense needs are those students who are on the autism spectrum and then some other students who have um, been identified with a severe emotional disturbance. So that's the program we are looking to implement. Dr. Dawkins will be bringing the staffing needs for that, uh, for the program during her presentation. Um, just know that we are looking at not necessarily, you know, we want to work so that we can transition them back into the regular school environment. And so uh, <coughs> the number of students will change as those, those things happen and then trans transitioning them out of the Meriki program into our program as well so that would um, we felt like the cost of it when we've analyzed the cost and everything it would be a win-win for the district with that so do we have a, um, a max capacity for this area we, it, right now what we're yes, presenting the max capacity would be about 12. okay yeah but in the event that maybe we may have to bring more in do we still have enough will we have enough room for others if if so or I know I know it has to do with staffing too, but and it also depends on the the level of the child that's the, the children that are there. I think and, and Ms. Hatley means physical space in yes, that area, yes, not just yes. staffing, but physical space. Yes, ma'am. Yes. There's enough for we have four classrooms okay. basically mm -hmm. there, and so we would we're looking at two teachers who would float between the, those classrooms, but then with paraprofessionals yes. to help support as well. So if you increase the number of if at some point it was mm -hmm. X number. <clears throat> What number could that be if we also added staff in order to accommodate? I know it depends on the acuity level of the students, yeah. but what would be a, a target number that you could it go to 20, um, 18? That would be, be at the, the yes, sir, that would be at the high end. end. Okay. And yes. it's a separate wing, correct? It yes. is. Okay. Okay. Well, and I think it's important to keep in mind, too, that we are able to serve the needs of 98% of our students with IEP. Mm -hmm. So these are the students with the most intensive and significant needs. And so we would be adding in there also like wraparound services so that we are providing um, a therapeutic educational environment so that we are protecting them and teach really able to target what their areas of need are. The goal is to get back to the home campus and to be able to operate <coughs> in the regular classroom. But um. yes. And I'm assuming they, they're all on, these kids are already on BIPs and they're just oh, yes. being yes. progressed. They're not progressing yes, at all. Yeah. Yes. But I like having them here. Yes. Like, you oh, know, yeah. I Good and the campus, the plan is for the campus retains ownership, so they, they are just, it's just an extension of the continuum of services that we provide, but they remain connected to the to their home campus. How many different home campuses will be combined now into Saginaw of the, the students? Right now, yeah. of the 12, it would be um, probably 12 different campuses. 12 different campuses. Yes, sir. And the parents have any option in this? If they we're no. going to bus them there, we're going to get them there so they don't have any transportation. 
Yes, sir. So whenever we, um, as an ARD committee, um, recommend a service that's not available on the student's home campus, that we um, provide, it's a requirement that we provide transportation, special ed transportation, so that they can access the services that are required for their IEP. Okay. And this would be really the a top, they're very high intense needs students, but it's not pervasive on every campus. We, we have the ability and the programming to be able to support the, the needs of most most children. Are the tra transportation need, needs being met now by a special bus service that runs for? Okay. Including the children to Mary Kay. Yes, we have a district, our children to district Mary transportation provided to the students who are currently attending Mary Kay. How do you anticipate the families will react to this? Will this be a good thing? No. For those students who are still in district, I'm sure it will be, I mean, it's, it's a positive because it, it does provide the type of environment that the children need to experience success. And um, regarding the transition from Marikee, it's going to take us, we're gonna have to have that open conversation and dialogue, but at the time that the students, it was determined that they needed support from the Marikee Autism School. Part of that conversation was the district retains, they are our students, they are just part of our continuum, and that our goal is always to to bring them back to um, to the district when we're able to implement their IEP. So my my expectation is that we have that open dialogue with families and that we prepare them, that we have this wonderful opportunity, they no longer have to leave the district to get their needs met, that we have the components of that programming now available in the district. And for those students that are currently on a campus, those students are not able to fully and be involved in the campus at this time because of the behaviors. And so they're not going to see a marked difference of them not being able to do something because they're here. It would be the opposite, um, more flexibility, more focus. We're also really fortunate this particular um, wing has, of course, an external entrance, but also um, is the part of the building, the WPA part, where I call it the office, where the office used to be years mm -hmm. ago. Um, and so it actually has a good distinct entrance mm -hmm. um, for people to come in and out. And although it is, as you mentioned, um, on that campus, we also want the home campus to retain a connection back to that program. And so that's important because we don't want to create a challenge for Saginaw to maintain their environment for their campuses. So um, we we're planning along that line, those lines as well. How and many are currently outsourced? We have four <coughs> students currently four, in a non-district placement, mm -hmm. yeah, non-public placement, yes. And implementation is expected for board approval of the FTEs, it would be early February. Mm -hmm. The comeback is an action item in January? I yes. Guess. Yes, we're, and I'll make the statement now, the, the one request that we're gonna have with the staffing is the ability to go ahead and post positions and not, of course, hire until the board took action on the FTE so we could accelerate the process of identifying staff and hiring them as soon as possible for early implementation in February. And training, training's critical. Do we have to do anything to <coughs> make accommodations in the classroom for them, make any, make any changes? Or? We're looking at a, uh, we'll have a sensory room. Okay. The class are really minimal, we'll create some um, movable walls and some, uh, we're ordering some resources. We can go ahead and do that with some of our federal <coughs> funds to get the type of furniture that is needed. And well, the training we can do in in-house in too. And that's what they're talking about, yeah. isolating it from the main hallway, but there'll be a wall across it with a door, of mm -hmm. course, to be able to um, provide some um, control back into the regular part of the building. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, report D, the Human Resources Report, <clears throat> 1920 additional staffing report, Dr. Dawkins. Hi, President Newcomb, members of the board, Dr. Chadwell. Well, uh, Dr. Parker and Dr. Hughes gave me the perfect segue for this, so I'm here to request the positions for the program. So as you can see, for teams, we are requesting um, one BCBA, which is Board Certified Behavior Analyst, and so that would be full-time at that campus uh, supporting the behaviors. At this time, two uh, special education teachers and then five paraprofessionals. And so those are a, um, we do say district-wide location, even though uh, we are housing them there, the teams. And the reason we coded that district-wide is they're not attending Saginaw Elementary School. So um, the program is a district-wide program for students across the district. So 
uh, we believe that those um, at this time that that would meet the needs of, of the level of students that we would be serving at that. So again, like Dr. Chadwell requested, if we could have permission to get this posted um, prior and then uh, bring back for um, action in the January board meeting. Because I know at this time normally we would look to Jim and say, Jim, we this in our budget and, and Dr. Dawkins has been working with Mr. Uh -huh. Sheely in order to uh -huh. identify the funds to handle it and right. we, we are within budget to be able to manage that. Right. Without objection, it sounds fine. Are we pulling staff from other current uh, campuses or would this this totally is the only position. one. Totally new. There could be people asking that are to do currently it. Open. There could be, we don't know of any that are asking to, to do this, but this is additional staffing. Because so there's could, some staffing so. that's dealing with the um, students now, right? Correct, but they those programs aren't going away. So they're just um, going to stay on the yes. uh -huh. Okay. Right. Yes. And we would be looking, as they um, suggested, it's maybe one student coming from a camp, one campus. So it wouldn't be a significant reduction in the staff that are still needed at that campus with one student. So is the cost, does the cost savings then, you, you said you thought this would be more cost effective, it comes from the fact that you're anticipating having to outsource a lot more, I can't believe four students are costing us. The four students? Mm -hmm. It cost us 10,000 a month each oh, at Mary Right. Mm -hmm. Questions? I think that ended all the questions. Yep, that's <laughs> <a good> question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. For the record, we're not mm -hmm. saying anything okay. disparaging about Merrick. They've oh, done a no. good job. It's just yeah. we have a, enough numbers now to be able to manage our own mm -hmm. programs. So we appreciate the work they've done with us. We're just ready to take it on. Next report is a TASB update. 114. That's why. Good evening. Attack about TASB updates. I know. Wow. I'm sure that was y'all's fa favorite yeah. attachment. We circled it. Almost a thousand yeah. pages. Um, <laughs> there, in the TASB update, there were 124 legal policy updates and then 17 um, local proposed. I'm just going to highlight just a couple of them. Um, there are a couple of brand new uh, policies that. They requested a CQB is a proposed new cybersecurity policy that um, I've been in communication with Kirk on. And then FFB and FFBA are new policies for crisis intervention and trauma informed care. And then EHBB is our policy for gifted and talented students. And this policy has been revised to ensure that all required provisions are included in the policy as reflected in what the law and state plan, including monitoring students and then us annually evaluating the effectiveness of our gifted and talented program. And then FFAA is a wellness and health services policy. And one of the laws this year was that marching band has um, also has to have a physical like our athletics do. And so we're proposing that they will have an annual physical just like our, all of our athletes have to have every year, which will be kind of an easy way to monitor that they're all getting their physicals. Is there any specific that y'all wanted to ask about? I know there was a, there's a lot. <laughs> No, so it's going to come back as action just as we've received it. Yes, sir. At the lawyers and everybody uh -huh. signed out. Okay. Yes. yes. No, no other questions. Okay. You get to continue on with another policy update on GKDA local. Okay. This policy is our non-school use of school facilities, distribution of non-school literature. This policy has been updated. Um, we didn't update it, but we're ready to now. Um, how we have moved to our electronic flyer delivery and those things. So that policy, that's how that was updated for um, the electronic flyers that we're now sending out. And also just that all of those go through communications for approval before they go out. That's that's in that policy. Is it currently all go through? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's updating policy to reflect practice. Right, yes. And that's the 
baseball, so all the all those cups of policy, YMCA, whatever is going to. Anything that goes out as a flyer that normally that they would have taken to a campus to say, would you put this, would you send this out to parents? That's all done electronically now through our Peach Star system, and we manage that system in communications. So this just updates the policy to reflect that practice. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Next okay. one is uh, it's CT local facilities planning. Um, so this is a um, policy that TASB did away with back in the 90s. Um, it was called a facilities planning policy, and there's not a legal policy for it anymore. And so we're just re we're <coughs> requesting that this policy be deleted. There's other policies that address our facilities and standards and things like that. This one we're just um, requesting that it, it it's a proposal for deletion. And again, it would come back for action in January. Any questions on that? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. We're in record time here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is currently 5.36 p.m. on December 16th, 2019. This board will now recess for dinner and then reconvene in the closed meeting pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act. 551.071, consultation with attorney. 551.072, deliver any purchase, exchange, or real property. 551.074, for the purpose of deliberating the appointment, employment, or reassignment duties of a public officer employee. 551.075, for the purpose of deliberations regarding the employment or specific occasions for security. And 551.082, to consider the discipline of a public school child or complaint or charge against personnel. This is a public meeting of the Board of Education of the Eagle Mountain Saginaw Independent School District. The board is reconvening the public meeting on December 16, 2019 at 7.02 p.m. I will now consider the subject set forth in the posted agenda. Welcome everyone to the December meeting. So we have a full house here. We're gonna start with the Boswell High School in our opening ceremonies. NICA. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, President Newcomb, board members, Dr. Chadwell, thank you so much for having us here this evening. I have five incredible students that I would like to introduce for the opening ceremonies. Zoe Adama. Zoe is a 12th grade student. Her parents are Jason and Danielle Adama. She is part of the principal's cabinet, fish heads, NHS, superintendent's council, senior class president, swim captain, Rotary Youth Leadership Award. She is considering the Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, Texas A&M, or Trinity University. Zoe has been nominated to attend the Air Force and Naval Academy by State District Representative Kay Granger. Uh, Representative Granger is only allowed to nominate five students within District 12, and she's also interested in the medical field as well as becoming a pilot. Hunter Boniface. <laughs> told you they were incredible. Hunter Boniface is an 11th grade student. His parents are Wes and Sue Boniface. He is part of Boswell Swim. Hunter is interested in software engineering and becoming a pilot. Hunter has his sights set on attending either Stanford University or UT. Hunter has represented Boz at the state level and earned MVP at Boswell for two consecutive years. He currently holds all but one of the school's individual records in swim. In addition, he is qualified for the Junior Nationals as a top swimmer. <laughs> Bria Muller, she is a 10th grade student and her parents are Frank and Jana Muller. Uh, she is part of Boswell Cheer, Varsity Cheer, Gymnastics, Bos Counselors Advisory Committee, Superintendent's Council, and Gold Standard. She would like to become a meteorologist, and she would love to cheer at Louisiana State University. <laughs> Oscar Ronquillo III. Oscar is an 11th grade student. His parents are George and Lucy Ronquillo. He is involved in football, soccer, DECA, Principal's Cabinet, Student Voice, EMS ISD Strategic Planning Committee, and the founder of Livin' and Given. And he's very interested in entrepreneurship, which this is gonna make sense. 
Oscar has founded a nonprofit organization, Living and Given, to help those in need. Oscar has inspired a large group of pioneers to assist in this process and has already been making a large impact on our community in, the, uh, in our community. In the future, Oscar would like to attend the University of Texas at Austin. And last but certainly not least, Ashley Tarver. Ashley is a senior and her parents are Patrick and Kimmery Tarver. She is part of AVID, National Honor Society, track. She's the basketball manager, part of Principal's Cabinet and the Boz Prize Pride Committee. Ashley is interested in being a cardiologist. Up to date, Ashley has earned, and I'm gonna make a correction because it was $119,000 in scholarships last week, but now it's $131,000. She will be attending Midwestern State and will participate on the track team. And while at Boz, Ashley went all the way to regionals in track, running the 4 by 200. Please join us in the pledges. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now for the Texas Pledge. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you all for having us here tonight. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Boswell students and parents for being here. We appreciate you opening our ceremony. Our next uh, area is communications, and we have several special recognitions. I'll call on Megan Overman. Good evening. We Good do evening. have a full house tonight, and we're excited to have everybody here for our December meeting. Our first recognition tonight goes to two very talented artists. You're going to see quite a few of those tonight, but our first two um, are those who created our holiday greeting card, and that's the card that you have in front of you for those that aren't here. This is the front cover. This is the the inside of it. Uh, these were created by talented Chisholm Trail High School students, and we would like to recognize the artists today. The, these were chosen, these holiday scenes were chosen for the district holiday card. So first up we have Colby Van Trees. This is the cover artwork. Colby is unable to join us this evening. Um, he, his uh, art teacher, Pamela Spangler, will be accepting on his behalf. I saw her earlier. There she is. Right. She'll be she'll be up here in recognition on his behalf. Colby is the son of Larry and Marissa Van Treese. He's a senior at Chisholm Trail High School. Second, for our inside artwork, we have Jasmine Ramirez. Jasmine is the daughter of Jose Ramirez and Christina Horcham. Jasmine is a junior at Chisholm Trail High School, and her art teacher is Carrie Martinez. Jasmine, would you? Where does she not here? Right in front of me. Okay. <laughs> would you come forward? Um, we have some a special. Spangler, if you'll please pass that along to Colby for us, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Next up, I believe we have Dr. Parker. She has a lot more artists to celebrate tonight. And we're getting your posters out from the back right quick. Uh, this is our second annual Saginaw Lions Club Red Ribbon Week Art co uh, Contest winners. Did I get that all correct? Uh, and I have Marianne Foley, Vice President of the Saginaw Lions Club, 
and Dr. Mary Jones, who is Vice President of Membership, so she may be hitting some of y'all up um, as well. And we have several, we have 12 students who are actually recognizing tonight. And uh, as they come up, if they want to uh, get their posters, do you want to do, okay, if they want to get their posters, we're going to give them a, a certificate, a monetary award, and a uh, We'll let you see their poster, but we get to keep them, guys, because we're going to take them back with us for the next level of con uh, uh, competition. So, as I introduce them, I'd like their parents to please stand with them. First of all, we're introducing third and fourth grade winners. Starting with third place winner, we have Miss Mika Brown, Dozier Elementary. Her parents are Melody and Trent Brown, and she has her little brother here as well, I believe. <laughs> and her, uh, the Dozier Elementary um, art teacher, Ms. Villarreal, if you are here, would you please come forward? Oh, yeah, that's right. She's in the honor card. Y'all saw, saw me. Second place winner, also Dozier Elementary, is Ms. Frida Race, and her parents uh, are, are, her mother is with her tonight, uh, Raquel Hernandez Rodriguez. Clean sweep from Dozier Elementary is a first place winner, Miss Aubrey Gardner, and her parents are Kelly and Jared Gardner. She will receive the first place winner receives one hundred dollars. Second place gets a fifty dollar check, and third place is twenty five. So that's kind of fun, ladies. We'd like to now start introducing our fifth and sixth grade winners. This again is a clean sweep and the from Creekview Middle School and Mrs. Scri uh, I never say your name right, but Scribers, did I get it correct? If you would come forth, uh, she is our art teacher and she's hiding back there. I see you. Uh, third place winner representing fifth and sixth grade is Miss Amy Ayala and her parents are Miss Tamara and Nelson Gutierrez. Creekview Middle School. Second place winner is Mr. Sam Bowie, Creekview Middle School. He's here with his parents, Mr. Hugh Bowie and Miss Bon Wynn, and I believe his sister as well. Third place winner from Creekview Middle School is Miss Alara Aragon, and she is here tonight with her parents, Miss uh, Allen and Mario Aragon. And Tiffany. And she is our first grace place winner of $100. Our seventh and ninth grade uh, graders also are a clean sweep from Creekview Middle School. So, Ms. Scribers, we definitely want you to stay up here if you, yeah, you're taking pictures, okay. Uh, starting with third place winner is Ms. Jasmine Desick, and with her tonight is her father, Jose Andrade. Creek Middle School. Desic, Jasmine Desic. Second place winner is Miss Laura Wiley, and with her tonight is Miss her mother, Brandy Wiley, again Creekview Middle School. First place winner, again Creekview Middle School. Yes, that six. Uh, positions filled by Creekview Middle School, and they were not the only middle school. They thought that, no, had, uh, from others as well. Miss Sarah Batista is here tonight with her mother, Dina, and Father Carlos Batista. <laughs> and sibling, sibling. Winner of another $100. Now let's have our oldest winners, our 10th through 12th graders, and I would like their uh, teacher, and I just slipped my mind, Ms. Martinez, did I say that right? Come forth, Ms. Carrie Martinez, third place winner, who was also uh, one of our winners of the Christmas card, Ms. Jasmine Ramirez, and her mother, Christina Horsha. Second place winner with her art teacher here tonight, Ms. Jenkins, is Ms. Sherilyn Simeon, and she's here tonight with her mother, Alta Grace Simeon. And our first place winner 
is from Chisholm Trail High School. Her art teacher is Miss Martinez, and that is Miss Elizabeth Akapov, and her mother, uh, Irina Akapov, is here with her tonight. Our Saginaw Lions Club is made up of many EMSISD employees, and these uh, monetary awards are sponsored by some of our activities, including um, the, um, y'all help me, what we just do? Hot dog and water sales at our uh, Night of Experts. So it's nice to see us involved. Okay. Hold yes. On we have excellent posters. Uh, the Regional Lions Club is very excited about our rebirth of the Lions Club and the success that these kids are having. So they are quite impressive. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to honor them tonight. Thank you, Dr. Parker. We're so excited to uh, see these artists in our midst. Uh, they did a good job, and we appreciate the Lions Club for uh, sponsoring that also. Megan? Well, I can't even draw a straight line, so I'm super impressed yeah. by these kids and everything that, um, all the talent that they have here. So I'm glad that they were charged with that task, and not me. Um, tonight, we also, to continue our recognitions, we have another special recognition, um, this time with the Saginaw Police Department. If you gentlemen want to move forward. Okay. okay. One of our students had the um, very special opportunity to step up above the call of duty, if you will, um, and help out our Saginaw Police Honor Guard. With us tonight, we have Lieutenant Brandon Badovinick, S Sergeant James Crippen, and Chief Lee Howell from the Police Department here in Saginaw to share some news and recognition. Dr. Shadow, President Nickham, ladies and members of the board, thank you for giving us a moment to allow us to honor this lady over here um, for what she did to give you a little bit of history uh, to how we got tonight um, last month chief Gene Springer had passed away um, after serving as chief of Saginaw for 35 years with that being said chief I was gracious enough to honor chief Springer with full honors at his funeral the only issue that we had is our honor guard was about two and a half days old so Chief Howell and Lieutenant Badovinic had tasked us with a daunting task of training that honor guard in two and a half days and putting together this funeral. Um, I'd like to give special thanks to Ms. Karen Presley and the Saginaw, Eagle Mountain Saginaw Independent School District for allowing us to use her uh, gymnasium throughout the weekend at the school, allowing us free access. That's one of the things that made it possible for us to train and to get this down the way that we could do it. Um, while I was talking with Ms. Overman, I was kind of talking to her about what we were having to do and she had mentioned, I told her, I said, unfortunately I don't have anybody to play taps. I didn't realize this till I started doing an honor guard that very few law enforcement agencies in the Metroplex at all have anybody that plays taps. It's very hard to find someone to do that. Um, a lot of agencies when they have a funeral will play it over a recording because they don't have anybody to play it. Ms. Overman was able to make contact with Ms. Allison Holly, who actually recommended Brianna Smith to play taps. At that time, I was kind of surprised, and I said, I didn't know we taught taps in school. <laughs> um, so that's how we got all the way down to Miss Brianna Smith. Part of the honor guard um, is not only providing honor, but doing it to perfection. So that's something we work very hard at. So uh, I'd like to thank her mom and dad for allowing her this opportunity. We had contacted them, let her know we'd like to take her out of school to uh, help us during this funeral at that time. Um, they allowed that to happen and told us that she would be honored to do that. Um, so at that time, we were able to pull her out of school, and I would like to thank you because she did actually play taps at this funeral to perfection. Um, in fact, I've been to several law enforcement funerals myself, and she played it just as well 
as the people that they do find to play it live, if not better. At this time, I'd like to turn over to you. Thank you, board, and Dr. Chadwell, and Dr. Presley, and Brianna, and your, and your folks are here, your parent, mother, and dad, and grandma. I know you're very proud, Brianna. Um, as a police chief, and, and almost 40 years in law enforcement, I've heard taps played more times than I'd like to recall. However, Brianna, you nailed it. It was beautiful, could not have been better. So thank you very much. If you'll come on up. It's, uh, it's my honor to uh, be able to present this certificate of appreciation to you for your participation in Chief Springer's funeral. And thank you very much. Thank you. Can't thank you more. beforehand so we do have okay. the good photo good. with them with the certificate so yes we have that told you it was a special night we have more special recognitions tonight if I could have our three teachers from Remington Point Elementary Miss Maddie Delgado Miss Shonda Dix and Miss Lauren Rocha come forward please we've asked these three teachers here to uh, to recognize them for going again above and beyond Call of Duty, they probably wouldn't tell you that um, because they love their kids in their classrooms and they would do anything for them. And, the, and they had the moment to do that. Um, in November, we had a student in class. your class um, who had snack time, um, had a piece of apple that just kind of went down the wrong, wrong type, wrong tube, and um, started choking. And these three teachers sprung into action to support one another and to help that child and perform life-saving medical attention that saved that child that day. And he is now doing just fine. In fact, they were probably more shocked than he was <laughs> at the moment, but we just wanted to bring them forward and share with you their commitment and their dedication and thank you for being there in a time of need. now have EMS ISD Director of Child Nutrition, Erin Wiley, come forward. I got a great phone call one day from Erin or an email that said, hey, can I talk to you? He said, hey, I need a video. I want an award. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hey, I'm happy to do a video on an award. That's fantastic. Erin Wiley is the recipient of the 2020 Food Service Achievement Management Excellence, that spells fame, by the way, <laughs> Silver Leadership Award. So I've been telling him he's famous. Um, the Fame Award recognizes school nutrition professionals for outstanding achievements in leadership, spirit and dedication, innovation, community involvement, and bettering the lives of students across the country. The Leadership Award is presented to a director with less than 12 years experience who demonstrates outstanding leadership, dedication, fiscal achievement, and innovation in menuing and merchandising. And I think we can all agree that uh, Aaron is, exemplifies that to AT. Aaron uh, will be recognized along with the other winners at the School Nutrition Association's Industry Conference in Indian Wells, California in January. Anything about the award you want to share? No, I'm just excited. My last chance to get it, this will be my 12th year, so I just got in under the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> We're super proud of you and super excited, and we want you to take lots of selfies while you're yes. there so that we can share this. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now to our final presentation in this portion of the meeting. Each year, the governor and the Texas Association of School Boards designates the month of January as School Board Recognition Month. We know that you all volunteer your time because you care about our community, our schools, and our students. And while we certainly don't limit our appreciation of you to just one month, we do join the statewide effort in January to celebrate and thank you. As part of the official proclamation, there's a document in your board book that includes all the legal language. Uh, rather than read through all the whereases tonight, um, I would like to highlight a few key pieces that reflect the service of our board, both collectively and as individual members. First, our school board members are committed to children and believe that all children can be successful learners. You also believe that the best education is tailored to the individual needs of the child. 
as reflected in much of your support of the work that we do, including the personalized education plans in our Aspire 2022 and our future 2025 strategic plans. You take your role as community ambassadors to heart and you work closely with all stakeholders to create the educational vision that we desire for our students. You are responsible for ensuring a strong fiscal foundation for our district, and your involvement proves that you are strong advocates for public education. For these and many other reasons, we thank you for your service and hereby proclaim the month of January 2020 as School Board Recognition Month in Eagle Mountain Saginaw ISD. This year's statewide theme is launching the next generation, so I imagine you'll see some rockets and things like that on your posters. <laughs> Next month, these walls will be filled with those posters and tokens of gratitude from all of our campuses. And you also are invited to be part of campus, special campus activities that are planned as part of this celebration. And you'll be hearing from your adopted schools if you haven't already. We encourage all of our citizens to join us in recognizing the contributions that you make as our school board. And thank you for your dedication to the students and employees of our district. More to come on this next month. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Megan. We appreciate that. And we appreciate you not reading all the whereas's also. Thank, thank you for not making yeah. me read all the whereas's. No. <laughs> we appreciate that. Yeah, this is, if y'all want to, I'll give a moment for anybody that hasn't left to give a chance before we move into the action items. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very bad. Well, that's where they stay, anyways. Turn their seats. Front rows available. Yeah. All right. Our first action item is to conduct a public hearing for the school first rating, the F Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas. Okay. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Newcomb, board members, and Dr. Tadwell. I'm here tonight to present our school first report. First stands for the Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas. The report is for the 2018-19 school year, but it's based on data from 2017-18. This year, the district received a C rating, meets standard achievement. There are a total of 15 indicators. Uh, the first five are considered critical. You must pass those, and we did. Those five deal with filing your audit on time with the agency, uh, receiving a clean opinion in the audit, uh, the audit disclosing no instance of material weakness in internal controls, uh, that we're in compliance with all debt requirements and agreements, and that we've made timely payments of such things as our payroll taxes and TRS and sales tax payments. Uh, indicators 6 through 15 have to do with our financial position and the financial management of the district and are worth a combined 100 points. Several of the indicators have to do with our outstanding debt and our debt service requirements. When the indicators were first created, or when they are changed uh, by TEA, they recognize that fast growth di districts incur a high level of debt to construct school facilities. So some of the indicators uh, grant exemption to the requirements of meeting that indicator if you are designated as a fast growth district. For this purpose, TEA defines fast growth as an increase of 7% in the number of students over the past five-year period. We have met this definition in the past and benefited by being exempt from some of the indicators, but with the opening of ILT, we missed this designation by 175 students over the five-year period. Indicators for which we receive full points um, indicate or include the number of days of cash on hand needs to be greater or equal than 90. We were at 108. Did revenue exceed expenditures or did we have greater than 60 days of cash? And we, uh, we did. The administrative cost ratio is at less than 0.0855% and ours is at 0.0707, so we're good there. Uh, it looks at the student and staff ratio if your enrollment is declining. Our enrollment did not decline over the period, and that's over a three-year period, uh, so we got full credit for that. It looks at PEAM's data quality when compared to the annual financial re uh, report that is submitted to TEA. Uh, 
You must have less than a 3% variance uh, by functional level, I believe it is. And we had 0%. We had $93 of rounding errors on a $167 million submission. Uh, there must be no uh, instances of material noncompliance disclosed in the audit report. We were good there. And no hardship adjusted repayment schedule for overspending our state aid. Believe it or not, some districts get their estimated state aid and actually spend that amount without taking into account uh, the number of students and all the different weights that we get. And they end up owing money and sometimes have to get a payment plan. So those are the ones that we got full credit. Uh, indicators that we did not receive the full points. Uh, indicator number seven says, was the measure of current assets to current liabilities ratio sufficient to cover short-term debt? This measures whether the school district had enough short-term assets at the end of the year to pay off its short-term liabilities. In our calculation, the liabilities includes almost $17 million in bond payments due within one year. However, we would never have to pay that liability out of our current assets for this year. As a, government in, uh, as a governmental unit, we are able to levy a tax specifically for that purpose. Um, if they had not included the liability for those bond payments in the calculation, we would have received the full 10 points. Um, indicator, oh, and by the way, we got six out of those 10 points. We didn't, we got some. Indicator number eight, we did not get any points and that is the ratio of long-term liabilities to total assets for the school district. Is it sufficient to support long-term solvency? This is the, one of the ones that we would have been exempt from if they had recognized us as a fast growth district, so we would have received all 10 points. And then indicator number 10, we received uh, no points for it. <coughs> it says, was the debt service coverage ratio sufficient to meet the required debt service? This is asking about our ability to make uh, debt principal and interest payments that will become payable during the year. Did we generate enough operating income to cover our debt service payments for this year? The problem that I see with this indicator is it does not take into account non-operating revenues. We had expenditures of 4.8, I'm sorry, 4.5 million dollars that we paid with maintenance tax notes revenue. We had another 150,000 that we paid with proceeds of capital leases, and then bond interest payments of about 750,000 that we paid with premiums on bonds issued. Those expenditures were counted in this ratio, but the revenues that directly offset them were not counted. If they were, we would have received six out of the 10 points on that indicator. If we received all of the, these points for the three indicators, we would have had a score of 96 that would have uh, been superior achievement. Now there's some, there's validity to a lot of these ratios and the different things that they look at, but they certainly don't tell our full story. Um, anytime that we are preparing to issue debt, we have to go through a, a ratings process. We had a ratings call with uh, S&P Global Ratings and with Fitch. They both reaffirmed our AA minus rating and they had some comments upon the, the completion of their re reviews. S&P Global Ratings cited very strong finances indicated by very strong reserves, good financial management policies and practices, and access to the deep and diverse DFW Arlington Metro statistical area. Fitch said that we have a strong operating profile supported by solid expenditure flexibility and high gap closing capacity healthy reserve levels, and conservative budgeting practices, which have helped to navigate rapid growth. The respect for our solid financial position is further demonstrated by significant institutional investor interest in our most recent bonds. We issued $148 million of bonds, and we had orders for $461 million of bonds. The strong demand allowed the interest rates and certain maturities to be reduced. The board and leadership team of our district have always sought to make sound, financially responsible financial decisions. We focus on the needs of our children and our community, and many 
of our decisions are driven by the growth in the student population and the need to build new schools to accommodate that growth. If anybody would like to have a copy of the report, Ms. Nevins has several copies, it will be posted on our website. Do you have any questions for me? Evidently the bonding ratings then don't put a lot of stock in this report. No, evidently. I don't believe they do. Okay. And as Ms. Valdez pointed out, you know, a lot of elements of the first report are things that are important and things that we do aspire to. We think they're important when it comes to particularly indicator seven and indicator uh, eight and ten. You know, we do have some concerns that she shared and the information's in your packet. Um, we believe personally, I believe that the first report is a system that was developed prior to the growth and the unfettered growth of charter schools. And so as a result, now that charters come in, you, by definition, any kind of competitive environment, you're going to have fluctuations in enrollment, um, just as we have had. You know, you have kids move in, then a certain number of kids that move back, and as a result, we dropped out of that fast growth indicator, which we know is ludicrous. We grow by, grew by over a thousand kids this year. Um, and as we were talking about in my office, it would be hard to demonstrate here, but when you have a trajectory that's growing, we know we're going to grow by uh, you know, tens of thousands of students, a blip in one year is um, going to be indetectable in the long run of the growth and uh, build out of the school district. So as a result, this system doesn't take into account any fluctuations um, or any flexibility. In the case of ILT, as you all remember, we found out, Mr. Newcomb and I found out at the same time about November prior to the August start of the year, they hadn't even broke ground. They broke ground sometime in January, February. Um, and then um, the building was open by August. We didn't know how many kids we were going to lose until August. We didn't get records until late July. Um, so the idea that we could actually adjust anything, and in this case, it's not even maintenance operation expenses, it's debt service. How do you do that when you're in the middle of building a building or a, a campaign? You could actually spend more money of taxpayer dollars by waiting to build a building because construction costs get inflated um, in that period of time. Um, and I know those are things we know, but I feel like just publicly making that statement that we do embrace um, being financially accountable. We work and endeavor to do that. Um, this system uh, does not take any of that into account. And I was very proud and I think very timely that the ratings call came out with S&P and Fitch. To be AA minus is, is not a norm for many school districts. We, are, we exceed in that area. And I'm just very proud of the financial management of this uh, school district for, for decades. Um, and predating, um, predating um, this current board and, uh, and plans to go many years into the future. So uh, I do can assure our community that we are in good financial um, structure. We are at the state level compelling that they relook and reexamine this system. Um, and, and we have not gotten a received a final determination on fast growth status for the special funding that's through House Bill 3. Um, that has yet to be determined. Um, that accounts for $5.4 million in funding that we could receive for this year's budget. We feel assured that we'll be there for next year. And just a reminder, even that system is an odd one because it takes into an account the percentage of growth of school districts. And so that top quartile of fast growth school districts are dominated, absolutely dominated, by very, very small districts. Remember, if you had a, a district of 100 and they grow by 10 students, they grow at 10%. Well, that 10% may be our thousand kids. That that's not that. We're, you know, that's five percent for us. Um, so that's just one of those things we're working at with the state level that they didn't really think through when they put some of these laws into place. So, and I guess you're looking if there's ways to um, reclassify, recode, or re the the uh, income that should offset the expenses that they don't let us count. Um, you mentioned that earlier. I think it was the, in number 10. 10. The, those, those income items are considered kind of below the line from operating income. There's, there's no way. Is there a I counting way or way I to I don't believe there is on, on those particular on items. On those ones you were mentioning. No. Okay. I think some of these ratios are, are uh, mirroring what you might see in the business world and ratios that are applied mm -hmm. to corporate uh, balance sheets. And, right. and, and it's just a, a different... A, a different structure or a different system than we operate under. All right. Thank you, Jane. This time, on behalf of the Eagle Mountain Saginaw ISD, I declare an open hearing on the 2018-2019 school first report. The hearing is open to public comment. Please step to the podium if you wish to be heard.
Another public hearing of the 2018-19 school first report is closed. 840. Is that right? 740, thank you. Please be advised that the report will be posted on the district website for further public review. All right, thank you, Jane. The next is to act on naming an architect of, rec of record for Eagle Mountain High School. Mr. Welch. I make a motion to approve VLK Architects as the architect of record for the Eagle Mountain High School. Second. Motion by Tim, second by Donna. Any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, and there are none. Motion carries 7-0. Congratulations, VLK. Look forward to working with you, Lisa. Next is to uh, set the board meeting dates for July 2020 to June 2021. Dr. Chabell. Yes, sir. That's on page 87 of your packet. This mirrors uh, the schedule from this year uh, that we have with the exception of the adjustment that we made um, for late in the spring for the May meeting. Um, so this does mirror as it was submitted this past year. I move we approve the 2020 and 2021 board meeting dates as presented. Motion by Donna, second by Liz. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7 0. Next is to act on bids and proposals. <clears throat> I make a motion to award the proposal of smoothie and coffee products and supplies to the Minico Food Products Package 1 for an est estimated annual total of $32,841.50 in Java Enterprises. Packages two through four for an estimated annual total of $61,869.80. Actual annual total will depend upon the district's needs and product usage. Second. Motion by Tim, second by Liz. Questions, concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7 0. Another uh, bid and proposal on the extension proposal <coughs> for guided and shared reading collections. I make a motion to extend the agreement with Heinemann Greenwood Publishing for guided and shared reading collections until January 31st, 2021. The estimated total annual expenditure is $219,432. Actual annual total will depend upon district's needs and product usage. Motion by Tim, second by Page. Questions, concerns, none, all those in favor? Please raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7 0. Next is to act on an intergovernmental cooperative purchase agreement with Region 10 Service Center. Jane. Mm -hmm. I move to approve participation in intergovernmental cooperative purchasing with Region 10 ESC Education Service Center. Second. Motion by Marilyn, second by Page. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7-0. Next is to approve an interim guaranteed maximum price for phase one of Basel Athletic Additions and Renovations. Cleet. Uh, yes, for your consideration, we have a uh, the phase one of the, the Basel Athletic uh, Program. Uh, we anticipate having four phases, and we'll come to you with three more interim uh, projects. At the end, we'll have a permanent uh, GNP to present to the board. What well, the first thing I think you'll notice in this versus the CSP is you get to see the documents, you get to see the pricing, you get to see how many people bid on our job. So on the larger things, you see a lot of competition. And in the first phase with the Kenneth K. Reed Ag Science Building, that is a very small building. So that's not the whole big project. So to get that many people and many trades uh, responding to this project, we felt very good about that. And, and pleasantly surprised for that so through this whole process as you can see you see the numbers we don't see those numbers in a CSP so you can see the competition and you can see that you know you don't always choose uh, the lowest uh, trade in there but if you don't there's a reason why it was recommended that we don't so you uh, we have that access to see that information through this whole process well, we see the CS we see the overall bid you're talking about the details inside the all the details inside. like yeah for example on the bottom with the recommendation we always just see the bottom number which you right. do here uh -huh. but we get to see the numbers we get to see their open books we audit <coughs> what what they spend and make sure that where our money's going big difference in how that is operating 
I make a motion to approve the interim guaranteed maximum price for phase one of the Boswell Athletic Additions and Renovations Project in the amount of $4,064,206 as presented. Motion by Tim, second by Liz. Any questions? None. All those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7 0. Next is consider authorizing. I'm going to read all this. The administration to terminate the existing contract of sale between Eagle Mountain Saginaw ISD and Lake Country Church, originally entered on April 22, 2019, and subsequently amended on July 22, 2019, and September 25, 2019, for the purchase of approximately 7.75 acres, more or less, out of Lake Country Estates Edition, Fort Worth, Tarrant County, Texas. Mr. Welch. Uh, yes, uh, in order to proceed with the eminent domain procedure on this property, the attorney has recommended the district first terminate the existing contract of sale. So moved. Second. Motion by Liz, second by Page. Questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7 0. Next uh, action item is to consider the approval of the proposal for engagement submitted. 124 by the law firm of Baker Morin and the hiring of that form firm to represent Eagle Mountain Saginaw ISD in the acquisition of approximately 7.75 acres more or less out of the Lake Country Estates Edition, Fort Worth, Tarrant County, Texas, currently owned by Lake Country Church. Mr. Welch. I move we approve the proposal for engagement submitted by the law firm of Baker Morin and that we hire the firm to represent Eagle Mountain Saginaw ISD in the acquisition of approximately 7.75 acres, more or less, out of the Lake Country Estates Edition for or Tarrant County, Texas, currently owned by Lake Country Church. Second. Motion by Donna, second by Marilyn. I'll just say we've done our best to avoid this particular situation. However, as we Noted in the contract, we tried two or three times to get some type of agreement made with the um, owners of the property. So I'm just saying it's not something I, I know we don't do lightly, but um, we do have a motion by Donna, a second by Maryland. Is there any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries 7 0. That concludes the action item of. The agenda, and we move on to uh, routine monthly reports. Any questions on those? If not, Dr. Chapel, the uh, 2020 board planning calendar. Yes, sir. Page 170 of your packet for the January meeting. We know that school board recognition month, and so uh, we will have um, a really enjoyable time just being having you all recognized and having people uh, present for that meeting. Did want to point out we have the first employee staffing report. For the 2021 um, in January, we also have the financial audit report. Uh, I know they've been working, and Jane's been working with our auditor on that report. That's been going very well, and we look forward to bringing that to you in January. Um, we also have, um, in, under consent agenda, um, the uh, submission of class size waivers to TEA that you'll see. All right, thank you. That brings us to the consent agenda for approval. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Tim, second by Liz. Questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Please raise your hand. Motion carries 7 0. Brings us to uh, the President's announcements. I just want to point out a couple of things. Thank you for all the gifts up here. Becky, thank you for the thank. Liz, I know you shared some things with us too. Thank you and all the gifts that are up here. We appreciate them very much. Uh, and, and thank you for that. There was an um, item at your place to vote for uh, something the foundation is working on. So if you would fill those out, turn them in to Becky, and she's going to forward them on. And then I also was told that there is breakfast at the maintenance shop at 8 o'clock Friday, and anyone that would like to uh, join them for breakfast is welcome to attend. I think that was meant for us up here, but I'm sure you all go right ahead. <laughs> All right, Dr. Chabell. All right, I um, just want a few announcements. Uh, this room is going to transform, I guess, as of tomorrow. Um, things will get broken down. I just saw a look. Uh, <laughs> it's going to ah. happen, isn't it? Um, it's going to happen. And then on Wednesday morning, this will transform into holiday open house. It's a wonderful day. We really look forward to it. 
Um, it's like having family coming uh, from all around. And so uh, that's that's on Wednesday. Where we're sitting right now, of course, will be students but performing. So looking forward to uh, Wednesday. Also have winter break coming up. Right after winter break, that Tuesday, we have the safety and security meeting um, that um, three of our board members and me and um, Dr. Baker is here. He'll be leading that work. And um, we, this is a different one. I'm just going to share for the board. It's unusual because it's, um, there's information that has to be posted. Um, there is closed session, um, but it's not a board meeting. So it at, looks like a board meeting. It kind of sounds like a board meeting, but it's not a board meeting because it's something that's never existed before. Um, so we are, um, I'm going to say we're learning as we go. We're working with our attorney to make sure we have the agenda set right because there are certain legal requirements that have to be met as part of that. And Dr. Baker's worked really hard to put that together and, um, and Ms. Nevins as will well. Will Dr. Baker be running the meeting? He will be. Okay. He will be. Teacher. And he's here. Is there anything you want to say about that, Dr. Baker? No. That's good. Yeah. We have a good agenda. It'll be busy, um, but we'll get a lot of things um, uh, produced. One reason why it looks like a, uh, a board meeting is we actually go into closed session during certain aspects. So we can protect our um, information for safety security um, and not have that out there in the public. But then we have to act in public to make sure that people know that um, we've come to consensus on those agreements. Um, also, we have a special board meeting uh, strategic planning workshop on the 9th. Um, that's going to be at Marine Creek Middle School. We're using the um, flex space upstairs. I think you'll really enjoy that. That's a space that Dr. Colbert and her class were in um, here just a few months ago. And so um, that's going to be a wonderful evening. Anything on that at all? Dinner will be served. And we're okay. going to have some fun. That's an important piece of information. Yes. Over. January the 9th. It's a Thursday, I believe. Is that right? Thursday? Yes. Okay. And then also just wanted to say that the strategic planning work that's been done, um, several of people that are in this room right now that worked on that group, um, and we had the reveal um, of, the, of the draft that came out, and we're ready to move forward on the work. It's very exciting to see it. I know a lot of effort has been put into that, and I just appreciate all those that have done so. Uh, last thing I want to say, it's the holiday season. Um, I think this is one of those times, even though it's busy, just like the holiday open house, you also just stop to think how thankful we are and how fortunate we are to be in such a great community and have family and friends and people that we work with that we care about and doing important work. So just wish all of you um, safe travels um, if you're going anyplace and just that you are able to enjoy some of that during this holiday season. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chairman. Seems there's no further business to come before this board. The chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'm going to adjourn. Second. Motion by Donna, second by Marilyn. Adjourn.